Uh, good afternoon. Welcome uh, to today's Grand Rounds. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record and also please, if you could, give the, the CME committee any ideas that you might have uh, in regards to future topics and future speakers when you fill out the program evaluation. Um, our speaker today is actually a member of the CME committee. It's Dr. Jay Brown. Dr. Brown is a product of the University of Iowa Northwestern. Um, he is a diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine and a diplomat of the American Board of Allergy and Immunology. Uh, I think perhaps his most proud accomplishment, though, is that he is the uh, credited as the inventor of the Swelfy. Yeah, um, Dr. True. Brown is here uh, to provide a, a, an update on primary immunodeficiency for the primary care provider. Thank you so much, uh, Steve. Uh, thank, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, this is an ugly subject. I have to explain Swelfy. I got a call last night at 3 in the morning from a patient of mine who has had repeated episodes of angioedema, which has nothing to do with today's subject. But, you know, the guy, I don't know if he really is having angioedema at all, because I've never seen it, and in the ER it's not really been documented. But uh, so my invention is the Swelfy. I want him to take cell phone pictures of himself with his swollen face. So uh, um, uh, I... Uh, uh, I really appreciate the phone call last night. I did tell him to call me if he was having more trouble so as to try to dissuade him from going to the ER. But uh, the fact is I have a cold, and a, a very bad cold. One of the nurses in our department explained that the kind of cold that I have is known as a man cold, which is definitely the worst variety of cold. This subject, uh, sadly, of immunodeficiency uh, uh, does uh, does not fit in an hour-long talk, and so uh, those of you who are in attendance, I appreciate your coming. You will earn your salad. Uh, uh, the, um, the fact is this is just an ugly subject, and as our molecular biology techniques improve, we are learning the molecular mechanisms of all sorts of exotic and rare diseases that uh, are probably as uh, noteworthy as anything for enhancing our understanding of basic immunology. Uh, there are over 150 of these things, and that number is just changing by the day. Uh, you all have heard of B cells and T cells, B cells making antibodies, T cells uh, kind of controlling B cells and the rest of the immune response. They're natural killer cells and complement uh, components in the, in, in, in the blood, and all these things uh, 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 can go wrong and lead to immunodeficiency. We're not going to discuss uh, the immunodeficiency states that occur when we uh, suppress people's immune responses and increase their interocular pressures with our steroids, uh, other immunosuppressive agents. I'm not going to talk about the loss of immunoglobulin, uh, at least not much. HIV and malignancies can all compromise the immune system. We uh, uh, are uh, also not going to talk about guys like me. A lot of people, is this feeding back? Is this sounding okay to you guys? We're okay, okay. Um, we're not going to talk about uh, uh, poor schmucks like me who get recurrent respiratory infections. Um, and uh, uh, I would mention, too, that a lot of the people that have had, you know, a dozen episodes of pneumonia, they're asthmatics. Uh, they have asthma, and they show up in the ER, and somebody says, oh, yeah, you've got pneumonia, and they leave with their Zithromax. And uh, uh, I think it's really important that we're mindful of that. It turns out that a ton of infectious disease, uh, or rather a, um, a ton of immunodeficiency states, uh, the dysregulation of the immune system leads to a lot of atopic disease as well. Uh, we're not going to talk about Munchausen's to speak of, but if you inject yourself or your child with stool or urine or whatever, you're going to be, you know, recurrent infections. And that actually is something on the differential of people who uh, show up with repeated infections. Um, I'd remind you, too, that, you know, being a human being uh, means getting sick, and that's par for the course. What's amazing is that, you know, a couple three weeks from now, I'll be back to normal. And uh, the average one of us will get about three or so of these things. Kids get more, you know, four or eight a year. I had the pleasure of seeing a couple of school teachers today who keep getting sick, and it's probably an occupational hazard for these young women. Um, I, one of my favorite medical journals, the Des Moines Register, uh, had a below-the-fold thing on uh, the average duration of coughing with your common cold is 18 days. I mean, that sucks, but that's life. Uh, and I tease my patients with colds, and uh, I I say something kind of, it's meant to be playful, and I think it's not always a hit. I say, you know what we do for that that's really helpful? And the answer, sadly, is nothing. Um, and those words come back to haunt me when it's me with, you know, 
my cold. So um, uh, I like exercise, hand washing, flu shots uh, for the people with colds, the saline irrigation of the sinuses, guaifenesin. And the new Infectious Disease Society guidelines are recommending that we wait 10 days before we start pounding these poor people with antibiotics. I'm not on one. My fiance my personal psychiatrist is like, aren't you going to take something? I'm like, well, I'm doing my salt water. I'm taking my Mucinex. Leave me alone. But, you know, she's like of a mind that I ought to maybe do something more than that. And I would in a heartbeat if there was more to do. So uh, uh, the skin can break down. The kids with a terrible eczema, they get skin infections. Uh, people with fistula, uh, fistulas, they, they get infections. People with uh, obstruction of anything. I mean, obstructive lung disease, a blockage of your urinary tract, eustachian tubes, all this stuff leads to infection. These are not the immunodeficiency states uh, we'll, we'll be talking about. Foreign bodies, I had a kid on the Indian reservation stuck a sponge up his nose. The four-year-old didn't have the wherewithal to say, I keep getting snot because I have a sponge up my nose, but when we pulled it out, we cured him of his recurrent infections. Ports, shunts, all that stuff uh, can lead to trouble. Resistant organisms, blah, blah, blah. Resistant organisms can make it seem like you are having uh, 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 a compromised immune system because you know, our drugs aren't working. And then secretion clearance, the uh, aspiration, uh, abnormal ciliary function, particularly cystic fibrosis uh, and uh, bronchiectasis are all going to lead to recurrent inf infections. So this is, pay attention, my most important pair of slides, like who do you lose sleep over, what are the red flags? Family history of immunodeficiency, you want to do the immunologic workup or send them to my partners and I, and we will help you with that. Um, people dying of early death from infection, that's not a right thing usually, or at least sometimes, and it's enough to justify the expenditure uh, uh, on the uh, uh, evaluation for our pediatricians in the room, the kid that's not growing, a lot of times they have these really complicated genetic uh, abnormalities that include uh, infections, in, include uh, susceptibility, increased susceptibility to infection, uh, need for IV antibiotics and hospitalizations. If, you know, people tell me, look, Dr. Brown, I get sick all the time. I'm on antibiotics all the time. I start really pricking up my ears when they tell me they're flat on their back in a hospital bed on recurrent antibiotics. Um, and then uh, uh, delayed detachment of the umbilicus, it, it would be a miracle if I get to slide 72 today, but more on that. That's the leukocyte adhesion disorder. It goes with that. So if your umbilicus doesn't fall off in 30 days, then you know you got issues. I uh, have a great umbilicus story uh, involving a dog that I won't share. It's a shame I'm in a time crunch. Um, uh, hypocalcemia uh, with seizures in infants, you want to worry about that because uh, that goes with the Georgia syndrome and more on that soon. Uh, and then there's the uh, congenital heart diseases, any congenital defect, you're you know on the lookout for immunodeficiency as part of that. Six infections a year, not looking for three colds a year. I mean, I think this is maybe three for me. I'm not concerned at four or five. Uh, the psychiatrist is more angsty about this than I am. Four more ear infections a year, a lot of times obstruction, you know, the eustachian tubes aren't working, and uh, my friends over in ENT will put a hole in the eardrum, and that will uh, be a great help. Uh, sepsis, a uh, couple times in your life, that ain't right. Meningitis, these are things that will have you concerned about a bona fide immunodeficiency. A couple rounds of, uh, or a couple of months a year of antibiotics, that ain't right. Uh, opportunistic infections, obviously, give rise to concern. Uh, pneumocystis pneumonia, that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, two or more serious sinus infections as proven on a CT scan, pan sinusitis. You know, somebody comes in with a snowstorm in their face. They've got snot all over the place. Check their immunoglobulins. It's a pretty cheap test. In fact, at the CME committee, we're working on, like, trying to determine did the effort of a talk make any difference. And I've suggested, you know, if we see a bump in the number of quantitative immunoglobulin studies done by McFarland providers, Providers, yeah, we'll consider that some favorable impact of this talk. So uh, uh, I'm not quite sure you want to order them on everybody you see, but it will make my numbers look better. Um, uh, people that don't heal well, sometimes that goes with uh, immunodeficiencies, extensive uh, granulomatous lesions, uh, unexplained fevers, and autoimmunity. It's really a bummer to be a patient with, an, uh, with a bona fide immunodeficiency because these people get a triad of problems. They get recurrent infections. That stands to reason. They get a lot of uh, autoimmunity and allergic pathology, so that sucks for them. 
But then they also um, uh, will get malignancy a lot more. Uh, it has to do a lot of times with the incredibly elaborate machinations that your immune system goes through to increase the variability of these cells. And so a lot of genetic recombinations and things are taking place, and that's where the malignancy probably fits in. Chronic diarrhea, uh, particularly with weight loss, is another reason to worry about that. And lymphoma in a baby probably merits uh, a, a, a screen for immunodeficiency states. So some very brief background. I gave two consecutive talks uh, a couple of years ago on immunodeficiency and uh, I don't, I, or rather on immunology because it's really a fascinating subject and I don't want to go through the whole thing, but you have the immune system you're born with, your innate immune system that, that isn't a product of these post-conception recombinations uh, and uh, that includes all of these features and then um, we've got the, uh, uh, and they exploit sometimes proteins and other uh, molecular patterns that are found in our enemies like, you know, fungi and, and, and uh, bacteria in um, viruses, the so-called PAMPs or uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So you're pre-wired for that stuff. That's part of your innate immune system, the immune system you were born with. Then you have the miracle of the acquired immune system, which I really do think is among the coolest things in the universe. Uh, and uh, you make up this huge library of new proteins to fight your enemies, both T cell receptors and an immunoglobulins. Uh, you make a huge number of these, and depending on you know what's already in you and what's new to you, uh, you know they 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 will gear up or or, or, or tone down. So um, uh, the variable region uh, again, due to these uh, genetic rearrangements, and it allows you to mount attacks against things that historically, you know, you and your kin have never seen before, which is really quite amazing. Uh, these random arrangements, uh, again, give rise to mistakes. Um, and so the way this works is really complicated. Uh, I'd refer you to my last talk, and I don't know if that's on the internet, but uh, it might be. Uh, you, you got these antigen presenting cells going around grinding up junk that they then show these T cells and say, hey, taste this. And did we just lose me? Microphone, hello, test, test, test. Well, I'd normally just scream right about now, but I've got a cold, so I'll take a microphone. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, these antigens are presented. Uh, that's such a shame. I felt like Madonna for a while here. That was actually, I was digging it. But is that better? Yeah. All right. So quick change in. There we go. Uh, so, oh, need my little slide puncher button. Um, uh, there's this uh, thing called an immunologic synapse, uh, which uh, uh, deserves explanation because this is, for one thing, really cool, and for another, the source of some of these uh, misfunctions of the immune system. Uh, your antigen-presenting cell will serve up uh, the yummy snack of some foreign protein from a bacteria, virus, or fungus, presumably, maybe from a cancer cell, and through a very, very elaborate uh, system uh, of uh, all sorts of molecules that I will have rememorized before I recertify uh, in 2015, uh, uh, this tight junction occurs uh, where you got, and this is a laser too, if you're clever enough to know how to use it. Oh, cool. So that slide doesn't come out real well, but in the outer circle here, you've got these adhesion molecules. Inside here, you have um, uh, 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 T cell receptors and these co-stimulatory molecules. And this is actually a natural killer cell. And it's going to deliver these blue things, which are, are, are going to create these pores in the target cell here. Uh, and uh, so not much more on those. I want to just remind you about the structure of an immunoglobulin. These Y-shaped things come in different flavors, but this is where the action these things. Um, you got your heavy chain, you got your light chain, you got your junction here, and this part is fixed, and this is where uh, a lot of your immune system responses are going to uh, are going to be originating. So they bind to the bad stuff here, and then this part can stick, for example, to all sorts of different kinds of cells and foment a response. This is what the thing actually looks like, and you can see the variable uh, light chain, the variable heavy chain, constant heavy chain region one, two, and three, and uh, uh, kind of Y-shaped structure. So uh, 
Uh, now we're going to talk about B cell deficiencies. Uh, well, first, a few more quick thoughts on immunoglobulins. We've got different kinds of immunoglobulins. IgM is the first thing your B cells, the antibody making cells, make. And IgG is arguably uh, 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 as important as any of them because this is what the amnestic or memory type response is going to be made of. More on that in a minute. This is now I take it back. This is the most important antibody because this is what is feeding my children and going to put them through overpriced private colleges. Um, this is the allergy antibody. It's really worthless here in Iowa, but if you lived in the third world where there are parasites, it could save you from the worms. And uh, IgA, interestingly, this is like 70% by mass of all the antibody that you make. This IgA stuff is kind of special because it gets squirted out in your mucous membrane sites, your nose and your sinuses, your lungs, more on that in a bit. Um, IgD, fish make IgD, how impressive can it be? Uh, it's kind of thought to be sort of an immunologic uh, uh, evolutionary vestige in a human. Although we've said that about other stuff that turned out to be important, so stay tuned. Um, class switching is the process by which you start off making IgM and then later make one of these other things. So uh, that goes wrong in people. Here they are. Uh, uh, structurally, you can see that they're not all quite the same. Oh, whoop, whoop, that's wrong. Structurally, you can see they're not all quite the same. Well, you could have if I didn't advance the slide prematurely. Sorry about that. And uh, uh, come on now. Yeah, so uh, uh, the uh, IgG comes in four flavors, IgG 1, 2, 3, and 4, clever naming. IgA comes in a couple of flavors. We do check IgG subclasses sometimes, uh, and IgE, the allergy antibody, uh, this thing binds to your mast cells and is all ready to go. The rest of them first bind to their adversaries, and then the effector cell will do the dirty work after that. So... Um, the way this is supposed to work is you get exposed to something, you make IgM first, and then, you know, weeks go by, you make some IgG. When we're evaluating somebody, for example, the viral hepatitis, we want to know what's the IgM to a protein from that virus, what's the IgG. It kind of gives you an idea uh, as to where you are in the course of that infection. When you're re-exposed to the thing, you make a bunch of IgG, and IgM is probably not nearly as important in fighting off future exposures to things. For an infant... Um, they get their, ba they get their uh, antibodies from mommy through the placenta. There's a very active process whereby these babies are filled up with antibody and uh, don't start making their own stuff till later. And that actually is the slide we will use to give rise to, uh, uh, well, I'll come back to that slide. So um, what do we do? You, you keep getting sick, and uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Arbalu has sent me somebody, or I've sent him somebody. We were asking ourselves the question, why do you keep getting sick? Well, the journey begins with the CBC, obviously. We want to know what kind of uh, uh, blood cells you've got in your differential, uh, the uh, stupid foot soldiers, the neutrophils, or the really smart cells, the lymphocytes. And... Uh, uh, your immunoglobulins. Remember, this is my uh, this is my big challenge: is to persuade enough of you uh, to order more immunoglobulin tests for those people who keep getting sick. Uh, the standard immunoglobulin panel includes IgA, IgM, IgG. I challenge any of you to order a pure IgG, uh, total IgG. If you know how to do that on the computer, let me know. But I think it, it's one of those deals where I don't think it costs a bunch more to get the, the M and the G. Or, I'm sorry, the M and the A. So I even when I only want to know what the IgG is. Uh, I usually will end up getting all three. IgE is the, uh, uh, is the allergy antibody, as mentioned. We get, I get the subclasses. Not everybody does. The up-to-date sources say, yeah, check the subclasses. Uh, Becky Buckley, who is a hero in the field of immunodeficiency, she's kind of lost her appetite for that. Those different uh, IgG subclasses have different uh, immunologic effects. They target different things. IgG1 and IgG3, they're looking for proteins, whereas... Uh, IgG2 is looking for polysaccharide antigens. Um, we look at specific immune responses, and this isn't particularly fancy, but we uh, will check specific IgG antibody levels to tetanus and to pneumococcus. We look at the 23 different strains of pneumococcus, and uh, then we immunize if that hasn't been done recently for other reasons anyway, and then we repeat the test. So if you just had a pneumococcal vaccination, I might just check the serologies of your pneumococcus and see if they're protective. We use 1.3 as a somewhat arbitrary, but, you know, the uh, uh, American, uh, or I, I think the World uh, Immunodeficiency Foundation, or whatever they're called, they've held 
endless conferences, like what is the threshold? 1.3 is what they say. Uh, and uh, so you want to use that as your baseline number. At one point, Mayo was describing everybody as having no immune response or inadequate immune responses to um, – uh, to pneumococcus, and I think they had kind of a, uh, a, uh, a rogue pathologist up there or something, and I think they've changed that now. But uh, then we'll re-immunize you, we'll immunize you, and we'll recheck these things a month later and see, did you improve your responses? Generally, if you respond with a level of 1.3 to more than 70% of these things, we think you're good to go. If you were immunized a couple of years ago, I check it, and you're above 70%. 70% of these different serotypes are above 1.3. I call it square. Uh, neutrophil oxidative burst tests. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Ar- Ar- Arbaloo and I were uh, just having a conversation about which one of those tests we ought to do more on that in a minute. Um, complement studies, you know, complement deficiencies, bona fide complement deficiencies leading to, uh, uh, immu- leading to increased infection are just rare as hen's teeth. Some of these things I'm going to throw at you, you know, there's like 10 people in the world's literature. I'll try to keep those slides brief. Um, so uh, more tools. Uh, we do this flow cytometry thing, and this is a really cool test. They count your cells one at a time. They label them, I think, with a fluorescent uh, 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 dye these different proteins on the surface of lymphocytes, and they count them and say, "Well, you have this percentage of your lymphocytes are, you know, have this marker, and you have, uh, you know, this total number of lymphocytes. So the absolute number of lymphocytes with these various markers uh, uh, are in your blood. And so we can look at natural killer cells, B cells, T suppressor and helper cells, and total number of T cells. Um, this uh, uh, CD45 RA or naive uh, lymphocytes, and these are the ones." that have already tasted something yucky and are uh, being vigilant for it. So we have another test. In fact, uh, Dr. I don't know if you got a sense of this, but uh, our new uh, and uh, beloved colleague, Dr. Uh, Arbalu and the allergy department, uh, we're having a romance. Uh, we are in close collaboration because we overlap on a lot of the same people, and it's a very collaborative effort. He was over talking about, what do you make of this? I This is a tough study. This is you basically feed uh, mitogens that stimulate responses to T cells, and then you see how do they go. And the, the fact is, you know, the, the fine print at the bottom of the lab report is this is a research tool. And I think, you know, I order these tests sometimes, but it's always a struggle to know what to make of them. If you really get dismal responses to several of these things, you know, you got problems. But as we discussed in the hallway this morning, swear to God, uh, you know, these tests are defined as normal or abnormal based on two standard deviations away from average, which will intrinsically lead to 2.5% of the people being too low. And so you can't uh, have a heart attack if, you know, somebody's supposed to be 72 and they're 65, yeah, you know, repeat it till normal, I suppose. But, you know, it kind of depends on the clinical context. It's a useful test. The old test was you actually poke people with various al- antigens like candida, trichophyton, and mumps. People have generally been exposed to these things, and they ought to respond to one of them with at least a little bit of a PPD-type response. Usually while we're at it, we'll check PPD2, uh, which is the purified protein derivative that indicates tuberculosis. Um, so... Uh, now we're going to talk about humoral defects. This is the antibody response. Remember the IgG, A, M, D, and E stuff. You don't do that the way you ought to. And uh, there are a ton of these things. Um, this one is quite rare. Well, I'm sorry. This is just babies that haven't gotten around to making antibodies. These procrastinating infants really don't have much wrong with them. you got to hover over them. You can't diagnose a lot of these immunoglobulin deficiencies until the kid's four because they may just be a little slow in making their antibodies. More on that in a minute. IgA deficiency, you're missing the IgA. Uh, who would have guessed that an IgA deficiency is somebody who is deficient in IgA? But um, these people, we'll talk about them specifically. Common variable immunodeficiency. This is really uh, uh, the most interesting, I think, of, of, of all of them because it actually does occur in the community. I've got like four of these people in my practice, and they are a whole grab bag of pathology, uh, even though they are lovely. X-linked A gamma globulinemia. Again, Rare, we'll talk about it, but it's a tertiary care center kind of thing. I don't have any of them. IgG subclass deficiency, Becky Buckley says it's not even a thing, but it arguably is, up to date says it is a thing. Functional immunoglobulin deficiency is where we do that pneumococcal thing. All the absolute numbers of immunoglobulin are okay, but you don't respond to the antigen like you ought to, and I've got one of them. I'm not gutsy enough to put those people on IVIG, and we'll talk about IVIG if the clock doesn't run out on me, but uh, the point is that... uh, 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 the IVIG, uh, for those people, 
it's controversial. Iowa City said, here, treat this patient this way, and I'm kind of, you know, doing their bidding. But uh, I think the utility of that is not chiseled into stone. IBGM deficiency is supposed to be really rare. I've got a couple of them. Uh, Brenda just sent me one. Uh, X-linked A-gamma globulinemia with hyper-IgM. This is for me and my boards. Wiscott Aldrich, Omens, Apex. I, I actually have slides that I'll probably just blow past when the time comes. So uh, there we go. So transient uh, hypogamma globulinemia of inf infancy, and because uh, I played with the PowerPoint long enough in preparation for this thing, I'm going to show off my new PowerPoint skills. Look, I can go back and then I can return. You all remember that slide. Um, these are kids that uh, uh, have values that are low, oftentimes not catastrophically low. Oftentimes, you know, they, they get ear infections and colds like all of us, but they're not dying, and uh, uh, occasionally they'll have a neutropenia. And mostly we hover over these kids, keep repeating some of this stuff. Some of these kids actually don't have hypogamma globulinemia of infancy. They are going to be bona fide immunoglobulin deficiency. And so the point is you can't, you know, commit to the diagnosis of an immunoglobulin deficiency until they're older. But, uh, you know, you, that wouldn't stop you from using more antibiotics. Their immune system isn't as robust as it probably ought to be. Some get treated with prophylactic antibiotics. It's really much based on their clinical presentation. Um, IVIG in these kids, probably not so much. So IgA deficiency, this is a common thing. In fact, this is the most common of the immunoglobulin deficiencies, which again, I remind you, are the most common of the immunodeficiencies. So, I'm sorry, the most common of the uh, humoral immunodeficiencies, which are, as a category, the most common of the immunodeficiencies. So um, this comes in two flavors, the uh, really nasty IgA deficiency and the just below normal IgA deficiency, so the partial and severe, um, you don't diagnose them under four, as I mentioned, and you repeat these levels about a month later because other stuff, you know, the steroid they got from Dr. Buck in their knee, maybe that has a role. You want to make sure you're really not wasting your time in labeling them as such. You want to do the immunologic workup for these people. And uh, this is, like I say, the most common. About one in 400, there are subsets of the population. I think our European friends sometimes get way into the one in 100 thing. But uh, it's not quite as bad as it sounds uh, because some of these folks don't even get sick from this. Uh, familial first-degree relatives uh, uh, will have 50 times higher risk of this if, you know, you've got a brother with this stuff. We definitely need to screen for it. Uh, maybe males more than females. And again, two-thirds of these people are fine. Uh, sinopulmonary stuff is what they get. So order the, the, the quigs is the shorthand in my line of work, uh, quantitative immunoglobulins. That's the IgA, IgM, IgG on these people who are snot factories. So uh, the people that have the pan-sinusitis on CT scan, they all ought to have this stuff, if you ask me. Otitis me. Media, uh, 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 general urinary stuff, a little less of that, and the GI stuff, particularly the Giardia, happens in those people. Um, the uh, IgA deficient people, they get anaphylaxis, uh, at least if they're severe, their immune system's never seen IgA, and it sees it and it mounts an immune response to an allergic response. Um, uh, autoimmunity, again, what a bummer to have an IgA deficiency, but on top of that, you are prone to all sorts of other stuff. So the celiac disease people, a lot of times you'll see doctors are ordering quantitative immunoglobulins or at least a total IgA level when they do the tissue transglutaminase because part of celiac disease so often includes an IgA deficiency. Well, you have an IgA deficiency, you can't use an IgA antibody to diagnose the celiac disease. Does that all make sense to everybody? If it doesn't... Uh, see me after class. Um, uh, it, it may track with inflammatory. This is IBS, not irritable bowel syndrome. IBS and IBD are uh, not the same thing, obviously. And they get more RA, more Graves, more type 1 diabetes, more myasthenia gravis, which doesn't need a comma there. Sorry about that. Um, they also get more allergic stuff. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, even the allergist needs to be on vigil for that stuff. You manage these people with more aggressive antibiotic use and you know, you uh, do those supportive things for the sinusitis, the very same kind of things I've been doing for my snotty nose. You do the salt water, you do the guaifenesin, you get good exercise, you get your flu shot, that kind of stuff. Um, you wash your hands. You know, believe it or not, the guy who suggested washing his hands before he delivered babies was like driven clinically insane by a medical institution that thought that was just the stupidest thing they'd ever heard. So I think that story is kind of informative in that, you know, sometimes uh, the wacky outsider guy is actually preaching, you know, the future, whereas 
you know, uh, it, we all don't like change anyway, so enough on that. Um, uh, in the setting of autoimmunity, uh, you want to be a little edgy about using immunosuppressive drugs, so um, sometimes uh, we'll consider immunoglobulin uh, uh, for some of our autoimmune people uh, who are missing IgG, for example, but not these guys. I, they typically do not get treated with IgG. So this is, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, 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 I think the most common, well, common variable immune deficiency, the most common of the uh, immunoglobulin deficiencies beyond IgA. And clinically, you know, like I say, I've got a, a handful of these people in my practice, and they're really important because things go very bad with these people. Um, they have low IgG. That's necessary for the diagnosis. They have low IgM and low IgA, one or the other. They need one or the other. Um, B cells are usually present, and we have no other explanation. They don't have, for example, a nephrotic syndrome where they're spilling a bunch of protein. They haven't been burned where they're, you know, oozing the proteins normally in their blood out of their burned flesh. And uh, uh, they, um, so the differential, like I say, decreased production from drugs, um, from anti-epileptics. Uh, Dr. Moore, I think, uh, uh, you know, some of his drugs will, will cause this. Uh, interestingly, there are other drugs that will do it. Malignancy, obviously, will uh, impair your ability to make immunoglobulins. And uh, uh, thymoma with hypogammaglobulinemia, I have one of those guys in my practice, uh, uh, and we treat him with IVIG. Um, increased loss, as mentioned, from you know, losing it from the gut, a bad enteropathy, you can lose your IgG that way. Uh, nephrotic syndrome is another way to lose antibodies and burns and trauma, as I mentioned. So uh, who gets this? Well, most of these people will show up uh, in adulthood, which makes them separate from most immunodeficiency states. The youngsters uh, who are immunodeficient usually show up as, as uh, I mean, you know, the, the severe immunodeficient person shows up as a kid, they get sick real quick. You can't diagnose this before six because of that uh, transient, uh, uh, immuno, uh, transient hypogammaglobulinemia of childhood. And in general, uh, you get diagnosed with this stuff in your 20s. And as I think about it, uh, I think all four of mine were. Uh, they are usually sick for a long time before anybody gets around to ordering the immunoglobulins. And you know what? They're expensive. They show up in the hospital. They consume lots of resources. They can die. So, you know, I don't want to have you freaking out and ordering immunoglobulins for everybody that shows up with a little pneumonia that you treat as an outpatient. But, you know, there's Becky again, uh, eight months after her last community-acquired pneumonia. You need to have a... a, 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 a an index of suspicion for this to catch it before they've been festering for five to seven years. They will damage their bodies owing to these recurrent infections. So uh, this is not particularly common. Uh, one in 25,000 is the number I found. And uh, they show up with infection. Uh, but they also show up with autoimmunity. So our friend Dr. Gerbracht, he also needs to be on vigil for this stuff. And uh, uh, they show up with a lot of lung disease, some of which doesn't necessarily have an immediate association with immunodeficiency. Certainly bronchiectasis is something that happens classically from recurrent infection, but restrictive lung disease, uh, uh, asthma, COPD, and cryptogenic organizing pneumonia uh, are other manifestations of that. 15% uh, of these people show up with bad tummies. Uh, so our GI doctors also need to be vigilant for this stuff. Uh, malabsorption syndromes are, are part of the presentation. Liver disease is the initial manifestation in, in uh, nearly 10% of these people. They get a whole range of stuff, but it's not intracellular pathogens. It's typically the kind of stuff for which an antibody response is going to be useful. So staph, strep, H flu, mycoplasma are popular uh, things, but they get a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, I'm glad I don't have to take Dr. Arbulu's boards because uh, he's got to remember all these wacky bugs. Um, GI symptoms, they get norovirus, uh, Campylobacter, and Salmonella. Uh, they get septic arthritis with uh, uh, strep and mycoplasma. They get meningitis, uh, which is quite a bit less uh, common now that we have IVIG. Um, again, pulmonary, they get all sorts of stuff. They get infections, bronchiectasis. Uh, we've covered some of that. And you monitor these people with pulmonary function tests on a regular basis as a result. So uh, uh, they get IBD, the inflammatory bowel diseases, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, ulcerative proctitis, and microscopic colitis, uh, celiac disease, uh, pernicious anemia, uh, bacterial overgrowth syndromes, protein-losing enteropathies, autoimmune hepatitis. In fact, one of my guys is being worked up as we speak 
speak for an autoimmune hepatitis, just had a liver biopsy uh, because uh, an ultrasound of his great big spleen showed a scalloped edge of the liver and the radiologist brought that to our attention. So he's seeing uh, 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 Dr. Hussein now, uh, GI lymphoma, which is a real mixed blessing because, you know, these people, they get a lot of lymphomas and you want to scan them all the time because you want to catch this stuff before it's evil, but you don't want to expose them any more radiation than you ought to. And so that's the dilemma I face frequently with these people. Um, uh, the GI disease, uh, there was just something in the uh, Journal of Allergy, Clinical Immunology, talking about how those guys that show up with the tummy troubles have a worse prognosis than the rest of them. Autoimmunity is about a quarter of these people. And we think that maybe these people get less infectious pathology with the autoimmunity. So uh, they get all that stuff. And again, I'm down to my last 15 minutes and I have, oh, so many more slides to share with you all. So malignancy, they get a lot of this. Relative risk, it's said in one of the sources, 1.8, but I've seen other sources where as many as a third of these people get cancer. So this is a big deal. And again, it has to do with the broken machinery that generates all these recombinations, these post-conception recombinations of genetic material. Um, they get less gastric cancer because I think we're more aggressive with H. pylori uh, than we used to be. So intravenous immunoglobulin. I'm done with common variable immunodeficiency. Now I'm telling you about the magic elixir of life for people who don't have IgG or at least don't have enough of it, IVIG. And we use it for all sorts of things, including these immunoglobulin deficiencies, but we use it also for secondary immunoglobulin deficiency, HIV, the parvo uh, B19, uh, uh, the bone marrow people. It gets used in transplant centers a lot. We use it for various hematologic disorders, and it's in your handout. If you uh, have eyes better than I do, you can read the microscopic print. And uh, uh, renal and vasculitic disorders, I mean, it is, it is the uh, cornerstone of therapy for things like Kawasaki's uh, disease. Uh, the smartest doctor in my training program had a nine-year-old with uh, a bad fever and she was a brilliant doctor and kind of sat on the kid with a bad fever and the sore throat for about a week before the kid showed up with Kawasaki's arteritis. So I guess part of the message there is don't treat your own children. So again, I'm not going to dwell on this stuff. I just felt like it belonged in the slide for completeness sake. So um, this IVIG stuff is used by Dr. Spencer and his buddies in neurology for all sorts of neurologic stuff. I actually have a bad asthmatic who went to Mayo for her peripheral neuropathy and she had that goofy T-cell deficiency thing owing to a lackluster response to mitogens. And the Mayo people and I were on the phone, what are we going to do about this? And we didn't really want to treat this lady with methyltrexate given her already compromised immune system or any other immunosuppressive. And it was their determination to go ahead and treat her with IVIG, which gets dosed at higher and more frequent dosing in the immunosuppressive capacity that it serves in. IVIG is an immunosuppressive drug, which is weird because it's immunoglobulin but it does do that. And I think they use this still for like really bad, um, uh, uh, really bad neurologic disease. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, yeah, that's fair to say, Selden? You guys use that stuff at all in your shop? Okay. So uh, uh, side effects, uh, allergic reactions to IgA. I've got one of those in my practice. Uh, I don't infuse her, but she's anaphylaxed repeatedly until Dr. Ballas, who's a great guy at the University of Iowa, finally honed down uh, the flavor of IVIG that she could live with. We pre-medicate the heck out of her. Um, venous thrombosis, new black box warning on your IVIG. And uh, uh, probably the worst side effect of the stuff is poverty. It's a flipping fortune. It's just a crazy expensive thing. So um, high sugars, because the stuff comes in sugar water, most of them do anyway. Fluid overload, I've never had issues with that. My people have good hearts. And almost all of them will feel poopy after they're done with this thing. So we do pre-medicate those people with antihistamines uh, just because that helps with the itchiness that sometimes comes with it. And, of course, would be useful if you know the patient's going to anaphylax. Non-steroidals can be helpful for the achiness. And I've started giving people a little aspirin a few days beforehand. So... What else have I got? The dose, this is controversial. Um, I uh, would tell you that I'm aiming for 900, 1,000. There's a paper out there. Actually, it's a meta-analysis of a whole bunch of folks where they drop the incidence of pneumonia in the IgG-deficient patient by 25% with each 100-point bump in their IgG level uh, from 700 to 1,000. So I'm kind of aiming at the... Uh, 900, 1,000 level, um, and uh, that, of course, makes this all the more expensive, but that's what our friends in Iowa City are doing as well, and uh, uh, 
do with that what you will. X-linked agammaglobulinemia. globulinemia. This is a wicked thing where you just don't make immunoglobulins. And uh, uh, there's an autosomal recessive version of it, but uh, most of it's X-linked. It's actually been around for a long time. And again, usually manifests about the time those maternal antibodies are waning. Uh, average age of diagnosis is 10, which is really a missed opportunity because a lot of those kids have been wicked sick over and over again. And you know, if somebody was lucky enough to check their immunoglobulin levels, even for the youngster, we might have caught it earlier. It's not that common, but it's out there. And these people, uh, uh, it's really nice to catch them. Uh, they don't make antibody. So uh, they don't have uh, B19, B20 cells, or I'm sorry, CD19, CD20 uh, markers. Those are B cell markers. They don't have those on flow cytometry. They don't have the lymphocytes coated with those things. So um, it's X-linked, and so that's the reminder of what X-linked genetics look like. Uh, mommies uh, bring this to the table, and uh, their daughters, half of them will be carriers. Their sons, half of them will have the disease. Um, and we treat that with more aggressive antibiotics. We use IVIG for these kids. Uh, they end up with bone marrow transplants, perhaps. And uh, gene therapy, this is actually a domain where gene therapy may show promise. IgM deficiency, I'm just going to mention it briefly because it's supposed to be vanishingly rare, although I've got a couple in my practice. And low IgM, but everything else looks okay. 300 cases in the literature. Um, and, you know, this is a little confusing because, as we talked a moment ago, by definition, every lab test we get has 2.5% of humanity below normal, right? So what does that mean? Uh, you know, there's low and there's low. So if somebody's supposed to have a value, uh, uh, and I think 41, I want to say, is the lower limit of normal. I've got it on here somewhere, I believe. Uh, well, maybe I don't. But if somebody's 36, I'm not sweating bullets. If they're, you know, if they're 20 or 15, it probably is a real thing. So we treat these people with more antibiotics. Uh, we vaccinate these people, of course, and prophylactic antibiotics, possibly IVIG if they're wicked sick. Um, uh, we do lots of other tests on these people. They are at increased risk for malignancy and autoimmunity. Uh, autoimmunity like most of uh, these uh, immunodeficient people. Severe combined immunodeficiency uh, is where you don't make T cells and as a result, at least you don't hardly make T cells, so there's a major defect in your T cells. And so remember, the brains of the operation are your T cells, and if they're not working, then you know if, if, if the general doesn't show up at the office, the colonel doesn't know what to do. The B cells are subservient to the T cells, and so if one doesn't work, the other doesn't work. And there are lots of flavors of this thing. You usually diagnosed early because these kids get wicked sick. They don't grow. They're toxic. And uh, we've got a new screening thing, which I want to tell you about. Uh, you pediatricians in the room, you guys have heard about the T-Rec thing? That all resonate with you? Oh, good. Well, then I got something new to share with you. Don't go just yet. So um, uh, I'm not going to bore you with the 18 different versions of severe combined immunodeficiency. I've got one I'll tell you at the end of the thing. If we ever get there, we're not going to get there. But uh, these kids show up sick. They don't thrive. They, they, they're pulling their brains out. Sometimes they have a family family history. So you might get to them even before they're, they're born. And uh, some of these things have sort of specialized versions, Wiscott Aldrich to Georgia syndrome, uh, the WIMS syndrome, where you get the warts, the low immunoglobulins infections, and uh, 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 telangiectasia, uh, uh, ataxia telangiectasia. Uh, and I fast forward through one because I am almost out of time. I wanted to get to this T-Rec thing because this really is new. This is a, uh, a new blood test done on a dried spot of blood on every infant in Iowa, and they've already caught a couple of these babies. So this is awesome. It doesn't work for everybody with severe combined immunodeficiency because some of these kids, their defect is distal to the point where they're making their T-cell receptor. But if the defect is such that they don't make a T-cell receptor, they don't make these T-cell receptor excision circles, part of the recombination of their genes is such that, uh, you know, they splice out uh, this thing, a T-Rec, and it shows up in the dry blood. Um, there, T cells, of course, are made in the thymus, and uh, I already went through that. And then they cut and splice, and they generate these things. And this is a biomarker of uh, making, you know, T cell receptors. Um, uh, and, you know, kitties, little babies are doing a lot more of this recombination than the rest of us. So, uh, you know, the T cell, uh, the, the T rec is going to be higher in babies than it will be in the rest of us. You pick it up on a dried blood spot. 
it uh, goes wrong when uh, you don't have enough dried blood on the dried blood spot or um, things that uh, uh, would inhibit the PCR technique like heparin or part of the sample. Um, and uh, if you give a baby, for example, a woman goes into premature labor and they you still juice the premature babies, uh, premature, we've got an OB in the room, we don't. Uh, I think they still stick those 28-week uh, premature labor mommies with steroids. That could screw this up. You'll get a false negative, again, if they, if they do make T-cell receptors, but their T-cells don't work for reasons distal to that process. And uh, so a ZAP70 and a CD40 ligand deficiency, you'll miss those kids. But it's a whole lot better than nothing. And uh, it's really important to catch those kids because they go real far south real quick. Um, B-cell screening may be on the horizon. KREC is the test. Again, dry blood. And uh, it's not yet uh, mandated by the state of Iowa, but it may be coming to a nursery near you soon. Uh, chronic granulomatous disease. Uh, this is where you, your, your lymphocyte, or I'm sorry, your white blood cells, the foot soldiers, the neutrophils, don't make this wicked poison called uh, uh, myeloperoxy. They have a defect in this four enzyme sequence that makes this uh, 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 oxidative burst that basically burns their enemies. So um, a couple other names for it. And they don't make these reactive oxygen compounds. Uh, about one in 200,000 people. So it's rare, but, you know, we probably have a couple floating around out there in our 17-county catchment basin. And uh, most of this is X-linked. And they show up. They show up looking nasty. They get these pussy things on their skin. So uh, uh, Dr. Arblu and I have been talking about what is the best test for this. And, you know, UpToDate has uh, an enth we usually diagnose these people um, uh, by five because they usually are all pussy and messy. And the NBT test is what uh, we're traditionally doing. And that ought to be adequate. That's what they were doing when I was in medical school. The newer test, the DHR, gives a scalar as to the degree of the defect. And then, of course, we can do genetic analysis to see where exactly their immune system went south. So we treat these people with antibiotics quite aggressively. Interferon gamma will ramp up their uh, production of these uh, uh, reactive oxygen species. And so that's used a lot, and that's arguably the standard of care, and will reduce infections a lot. Um, stem cell transplant has been tried. This is a bad thing to have. You do not want to come home with this diagnosis. A lot of these people will die uh, if the x link version is m worse than the uh, autosomal recessive version, but you see those numbers there. I did want to talk about the Georgia syndrome because it's actually, it's out there. Uh, uh, it's a deletion of a piece of your 22nd chromosome. Uh, and uh, 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 in fact, they came up with a new name for it, the 22Q deletion syndrome, which does not roll off the tongue, I don't think. One in 4,000 live births. So that's a lot of this. It has a, an extremely variable presentation. But I think this is important enough to probably want to spit out at you guys. I fortunately loaded my slides with the most important, most common stuff first. And we're at the end of the road. Um, haplosufficiency syndrome, meaning a patient has about a half a chance of getting a kid with this, and spontaneous mutations are most of it. So what's happened with these kids is uh, they are embryologically uh, uh, going to show up different. Um, they have this deletion of a chromosome. What happened there? Whoops. Duplicate slide. Sorry about that. So they show up with cardiac abnormalities most of the time, which is why I remember in my, one of my early slides, I said, kid with a cardiac abnormality, you want to look at their immune system. And by that, I mean even flow cytometry and a bad idea because you'll get a sense of their T cells, um, all sorts of cardiac abnormalities. Hypocalcemia, because part of this embryologic abnormality, not only are missing a thymus, which is where your T cells are all born, but you know they're goofed up in the neck. They have all sorts of facial features that can be uh, 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 in association with this. And uh, they have oftentimes uh, goofed up immunoglobulin as well because the T cells tell the B cells what to do. Uh, they have palatal defects about half the time, rarely cleft lip, it's cleft palate, and uh, hypocalcemia, any of those things, and they probably ought to be evaluated for that. You see in the picture, this dude's got a strabismus that goes with it. This kid's ears are pretty far down there, and uh, they get a broad 
uh, nose there. Those are uh, 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 typical features. I like this mnemonic, Catch-22, not a reference to Joseph Heller. Well, sort of, I suppose. But uh, uh, cardiac abnormalities, abnormal facial features, thymic aplasia, which is why they have the immunodeficiency. They get a cleft palate, and they get hypoparathyroidism and hypocalcemia and seizures as a result. So a baby who's seizing, you know, be thinking about this. Uh, additional manifestations, uh, they get esophageal issues, they get strabismus, as mentioned, renal anomalies, uh, they have dental issues, they're short, and they have hearing loss quite commonly. And they're uh, uh, ADHD, autism, uh, other behavioral stuff, maybe 25, 30% more schizophrenia, uh, or I'm sorry, 25, 30 times more schizophrenia in adult life. Uh, that's a very late presentation. Hypothyroidism is mentioned. And they get autoimmunity because it sucks to have an immunodeficiency state, and they're allergic. So I think having said that, uh, well, let's talk about the pathophysiology. Then I'm going to open it up to any questions. And I want to show you my little doodle because I thought it was entertaining. Um, uh, they have this deletion. They're missing. I mean, that just kills me that you can be born live missing three million base pairs. We are resilient creatures. About 45 genes, that is to say, those three million base pairs, the ACTG stuff, uh, when grouped together, they form genes which make proteins, and you can be missing 45 proteins. A lot of variability in this, and uh, the neural crest tissue migration is typically part of this thing, and I have slides on neural crest tissue migration. The diagnosis uh, can be done with fish, fluorescence in situ hybridization, which is slow and expensive. PCR, I think, is a little more expensive, but it's, I think, what most people are doing. And my best advice on these kids, and tell me pediatricians if I'm wrong, ship these youngsters off to the genetics clinic. They are a whole ball of wax. So, I mean, there's a whole bunch going wrong with them. So, without further ado, I think I will open up the floor to questions. Let's see how far into this thing I took you guys. Um, Oh, that was pretty close. I had the clever slide. I was going to talk about zebras, and uh, this is my doodle. And uh, uh, having said that, uh, any questions from the audience? Dr. Brown, thank, for, thank you for mentioning my name six times during the yeah. lecture. I counted. I, I didn't say anything bad about you, Ricardo. Oh, so that was great. I, this was not paid, by the way, for the audience. So um, I was wondering, like, more people are going to be doing immunoglobulin testing, probably as a result of your great talk, which I appreciate. Um, any comments on when not to test this, for instance? I, I do not think I, I know the answer to when you're acutely ill, uh, do you test for this? Is it right. worth? Excellent I mean, and point. how long after that do you treat? I, I follow you. Yeah, I think, you know, the lawyers have a thing. There's a Paul Newman uh, uh, movie. It was just okay, I thought, at the time, the verdict. But it had a great line in there. I think that was the movie that had this line. Uh, lawyers have a thing. Don't ask a question to which you don't already know the answer. And, you know, you go fishing around willy-nilly with every schmuck like me who has a cold. You know, don't do that because, you know, clinically I'm good. I'm not sure I'm a poster child for this. And in this setting of acute infection, you know, they can ramp up some of these immunoglobulins and maybe look better than they are. So I think in answer to your question, you really want to be testing people who meet some of these criteria for a, a legitimate index of suspicion and probably not in the throes of, of, of overwhelming infection. Uh, because, you know, they're both increasing their production of, of these immunoglobulins and they're, they're consuming them more. So, you know, if you find wacky numbers too high, too low, we don't really care that much about too high, although I would say, you know, missing uh, uh, some monoclonal gammopathy would be a bummer. So if, if, if they're pretty high, I, I do do serum protein electrophesis, maybe even urine protein electrophesis. But if they're, uh, you know, does that, is that what you were looking for? Yes. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Thank you, Ricardo. I appreciate that. Uh, get it, Frank Floyd Wright. Uh, oh well, it's just me. Uh, Selvin. Suppression, and oh, man with myasthenia on immunosuppression, <clears throat> and he makes the point to me that once he got on immunosuppression, all his allergy and uh, recurrent colds went down. He doesn't get colds anymore. Yeah. So it kind of begs the question. What is the optimal immune set, and you know what is normal, what is hyper, and well, what does that mean to you? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, uh, the people that show up in my office for their hay fever, uh, which is really my day job, this is a hobby. I, the immunodeficiency stuff is fascinating to me, but um, not what most of my patients have because these things are pretty rare. 
But uh, they often show up, these hay fever people show up saying, I've got the cold that doesn't go away. So, you know, one's left to wonder if your guy maybe has allergies and you've cured him with immunosuppressives. Uh, so uh, does that answer your question, Tom? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, that's what I do for a living. You know, these people that have these robust immune responses to parasites, you know, they shouldn't do that. That's allergies. Uh, it turns out those are the allergies. You drop us in a Brazilian jungle, we're going to do better than the rest of you guys in fighting off worms, which is probably evolutionarily why some of us make all these allergy antibodies. But in answer to your question, uh, uh, you know, that doesn't shock me to find out the guy actually is feeling pretty good. Plus, you know, these immunosuppressives you're using, you're not nuking his immune system. I mean, the, the fact is our immunosuppressives are not surgical strikes, but you're also not clobbering him to the point that, you know, he's essentially naked like a skid kid would be. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? Yes, John. We're going to get Emily some exercise. It'll be somebody on this side of the room's turn to answer questions. Make sure Emily stays in shape. After I'm done, Dr. Spencer has another question, so you have yeah. to run it back there. Um, uh, as, as a pediatrician, this shows up in our journals about IgA deficiency, and there was a time about, I remember about five, ten years ago, where they said that we should check IgA levels on every kid who has more than like three to five ear infections in a year. And that's half of the children you Which care is, for. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Really. So, you know, so... So my impression has always been that IgA deficiency is probably one of the least serious immunodeficiencies that we deal with because most of the kids tend to outgrow them. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And that's not going to lead to a radical alteration in your management of these kids. A little bit, but we're not going to put any you know, overpriced replacement product in their vein. And uh, neither uh, are we going to, I mean, you know, uh, even if the IgA is normal, but you're on the kid with the umpteenth, you know, infection. I mean, prophylactic antibiotics become a consideration more in the setting of an IgA deficiency. A little earlier intervention, yeah, you're waving off these mommies with a febrile kit a lot, appropriately, and, you know, you're maybe not waving quite so vigorously if you know the kid, like, doesn't make IgA. Your enthusiasm for ear tubes, your enthusiasm for intervention with antibiotics, I have to guess, you know, the threshold would be lower to notch if you knew they were IgA deficient. But so uh, you, you have a sense then when we should do it then? Gosh, you're looking for a number? Yeah. You're still sore about the $40 thing, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I am, actually. Um, but, that's, but we'll so, talk about uh, that later. No, no, that's a joke. I'm, that, I, I'm, I'm joking. That was a joke. Uh, uh, an inside joke. I'm sorry for that. Um, yeah, really, uh, yeah really I, you know, I don't really right have, well, you know, if the kid is growing really well and, the, you know, if the mom is on the Internet and really angsty, you know, Professor Mom, just get the damn thing, you know. But uh, uh, I think in seriousness, uh, uh, it's, I, I have great faith in you and your partners and their clinical judgment. But I will tell you, too, we miss some of these kids. And, you know, I think collectively we could all lower our threshold a little bit. And in the world of an ACO, you might even make a case that as expensive as the IVIG stuff is, having these people dwindle and die is a lot more expensive, just dollars and cents, than fi identifying them for who they are and then treating them appropriately, even though it's an expensive set of treatments. Okay. Thanks. Well, thank you all uh, for coming. I appreciate your attentiveness.